you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to cover what's new and happening in Kubernetes. And shout out to the release team, who is uh, apparently very fond of this national Italian chain that provides unlimited breadsticks for all. <laughs> OK, so Kubernetes 1.16, um, super exciting. There are 31 enhancements, including 15 new features in alpha, um, eight of them, eight new features moving to beta and eight moving to stable. Um, some highlights include a bunch of new enhancements in the storage space. Um, CRDs and admission webhooks are moving to GA. Um, there's also a big metrics overhaul. Uh, what this means is more consistent metrics names and a bunch of new metrics and different components in the, in the cluster. OK, so diving in to the cluster um, storage enhance enhancements, there are a lot of new features graduating to beta, making operations with storage and production a lot more manageable. You can resize your volume now with an external controller that watches your volumes for changes and triggers resizing operations. You can also create a new volume that is a clone of another volume. And uh, you can also do inline volume support. Is, well, inline volume support is moving to beta, which is super convenient if you want an ephemeral volume that is attached to your pod and only exists for the duration of the pod's lifetime. Um, and the screenshot here might be a little small for those in the back. Um, is an example of how you might do this in YAML, which is everyone's favorite. Um, and then there's also a bunch of new stuff happening in Windows land. Um, there's now Coop Adam join, woo, yeah, support for Windows users. Um, most, more importantly, I th there are a bunch of new important security features for Windows that shipped in 1.16. Um, Active Directory Group Managed Service Account is graduating to beta. This means that at deployment time, you can choose the GMSA and run, control, run containers using it to connect to existing applications, such as your database. Um, and you can remain compatible with how authentication and authorization are managed inside your organization. With this new feature, you can also use the run as username Windows specific property to define which user will run your container's entry point. This is an alpha feature that you have to enable when you run 116. Um, I'm particularly excited about ephemeral containers. How many of you have had to answer the question of, OK, cool, now that my application is in Kubernetes, how do I debug it? Yeah. Yeah, very common question, <laughs> um, especially if you have minim minimal container images that are literally built from scratch. So ephemeral containers al allow you to attach a container to a running pod so you can do things like run debugging tools in a separate debug image um, and use the pod's network namespace. So you could do things like TCP dump in your pod that is running already. Or maybe you want to inspect the file system of your target container. This is even more useful if you combine it with um, turning on the process namespace sharing. This feature, again, is in alpha, so you have to turn it on when you run 116. Once you do it, you can install kubectl plugins, such as kubectl debug, to start attaching a debug container to your pod, like this example. Node Topology Manager. This feature is super useful if you're running anything that's performance sensitive um, and compute intensive. So anything high performance computing related, machine learning workloads. So for example, in this diagram, um, you can see there are eight GPUs in this server and there are a number of GPUs that are connected with high speed connect and VLink. Um, but there are also pairs of GPUs that are not connected. Um, so previously, if you were to request, let's say, one CPU and two GPUs from Kubernetes for your pod, 
you could very well end up with two GPUs that are actually not connected with these high-speed connections. Um, with the new node topology manager, it'll help Kubernetes understand what the topology is on the hardware. So now you could say, um, you could tell Kubernetes to uh, understand or even enforce device affinities when you're scheduling your workloads. Next up, I want to talk a little bit about our cloud providers. Um, cloud providers have historically been part of the Kubernetes releases. They're now moving out of tree. And this means that the Kubernetes repo and binaries are getting slimmer. And it'll enable the cloud providers to iterate faster on their integration with Kubernetes. Last but not least, I want to mention other notable features that are shipped in this release. Um, there's a keynote tomorrow dedicated to IPv4, IPv6 dual stack support. So I won't go too much into detail here. I also want to mention that as we see larger and larger deployments of Kubernetes out in the wild, the design continues to be optimized. The new Endpoint Slice API is an example of that optimization happening in the community. Lastly, the pod topology spread constraints allows you to control how your pods are distributed across different failure domains. So for example, if you run a multi-availability zone cluster, you can now tell Kubernetes how you want to spread your pods across the different availability zones. This is super useful if you run anything where you want finer control over how things fail. So none of this would have been possible if not for our release team. So thank you to the release team led by Lachlan. And also, a mind-blowing number of 32,000 contributors to date. Um, every month, we have over 1,000 different companies and over 3,000 individuals contributing to the projects. So thank you. And now, I want to invite these seven individuals to the stage. Um, so the Kubernetes Bootstrap Committee came together in 2017 to create a charter for Kubernetes governance. With the election last month, all seven of them have now moved on to emeritus status. Let's welcome them to the stage and thank them for the role setting up Kubernetes governance. <laughs> And that wraps up my update in Kubernetes land. Thank you.